Okay, this, is, this really is a big cheat because um, this is the talk that I did for last year. Uh, so what's life going to be like in 30 years time? It is, the kind of, it, it is those kinds of questions like that generation uh, ahead. So where do you ask to find out what's life going to be like? I asked on uh, Reddit. I said, so you know, what do people on Reddit think that life's going to be like in 30 years time? Um, and I got some very strange answers, uh, as you would expect. Uh, but let's read it for you. So uh, somebody wanted to start telling me about the uh, train stations and how the train station, so this is Edge Hill train station. Uh, and they were talking about advances in, uh, in transport. I was kind of thinking it's a bit like HS2, where we had HS2 at the time. Um, transportation network around the city. So the, uh, there used to be train lines going from Edge Hill straight down to the dock around Park Lane kind of area. There's the other old tunnel there that you can see. Um, the world's first intercity train station um, would reopen, and that was based in, uh, geez, I can't remember the name of the park now, but um, it's not far from me off uh, Parliament Street, and that's where the uh, first train station was. Um, so the other thing, which this is Reddit, so the other thing that people were asking about was, uh, or commenting about was zombies, you know, uh, you know there's gonna be a zombie apocalypse, and in 30 years time, there'll be Bazooka Joe's would still be open, and also the leather shop, which everybody mentions in uh, Liverpool Central Station, that will never close. And of course, you've got the two going hand in hand, the zombie apocalypse will be happening, and the leather shop will still be open. Uh, picture of a zombie apocalypse, just in case you've never seen uh, what one looks like. But how will Liverpool fare within a zombie apocalypse? Actually, we're really, we're really low stakes. We are, we're going to die quite quickly. Top cities to survive there were Edinburgh, uh, were Dundee and somewhere else. Um, tidal barrages, you know, if we're looking for energy generation for the future, 30 years time, will we see the tidal barrage take place? That project has been hanging around for so very, very long. Is, and if we do get tidal barrage uh, generating energy, what will happen when the water levels rise across the city? Uh, how will that be affected? So there's lots of big issues for Liverpool to face. This is what, with a 20 meter sea level rise, that's what Liverpool would look like. Uh, I think I'm okay on that map, uh, but I know that lots of others won't be. That's with a 20 meter sea level rise. So there's lots of these issues that we need to um, uh, be paying attention to, just a pretty photo of buildings underwater and what Liverpool might be like in 30 years time. Uh, so will we be living in high rises and just travelling backwards and forwards between the two? Or will we be flying around in, uh, in cars? Um, you think that's a bit mad? There you go, there's a real one. Uh, real jet car, and you can buy these things in, uh, in the supermarket these days, uh, but they do have a hefty price tag. Or will we be facing, you know, complete and utter economic depression with, um, and that will be somebody's new house, will there be the social pressures um, on society, will the unemployment line be absolutely huge? Uh, and technology-wise, will we be pa making payments through scanning our palms? Uh, do we have that kind of thing, you know, or we're scanning our phones now, but in China you can currently do that or by scanning your palm. According to Elon Musk, we will all be living on um, Mars by 2050. Well, maybe not all of us, maybe just him on his own. Let's make sure it's just him on his own. Yeah, no, no, no radiation. Don't worry about it. You carry on Elon. Um, so there's, you know, we, I don't think that we talk often enough about the future and how we plan for the future and what's going to happen and how we're going to get on in the future. So that was the whole idea behind the, this kind of cosy conference, these kinds of talks, was to get people to talk a little bit more uh, about the future. So without further, uh, further ado, and in other words, just to get the microphone away from me, because I will just stand and ramble, ramble um, we'll hand over to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, if you want to come up here, use this microphone. You can hold it in your hand or you can have it on here.
This is why I've never been invited to Glastonbury, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Right, we're off. Uh, I'm at the wrong conference. I should be at one called the Cold Buckets of Water Conference. Uh, as you can see, I'm going to find the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Should I shut up? People in the audience are saying, shut up, Kevin. Sorry, can you... That, I'm completely thrown. Can you start again? I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop if ever there's an announcement. Okay, we'll wait till Dan to come back. Oh, uh, because he's doing the same. He's just trying to lay off the um, lay off the feet. Okay, he's back. He's rolled his sleeves up. I think he's punched someone. <laughs> I'll assume this is the official recording. I'm at the wrong conference. I'm at the Pour a Bucket of Cold Water conference. Because as you can see, I'm talking about medicine and longevity. I chose this theme because I'm very old and I take lots of medicine. But uh, um, I'm actually predicting things that will never happen. Uh, because, or perhaps they will. Um, this is what lots of us are expecting this morning. You know, bright new dawn, new regime, things can only get better. The reality is this, uh, life expectancy is worsening and kids particularly are getting poorer and sicker because of junk food and poverty. All straightforward, but that's the reality. The reality is worse where three of us at least come from, we're all, uh, if you look at any of those indicators, they're absolutely shocking. You know, people live less, they live shorter lives and they live impoverished lives but Wirral is not alone but just take that one you know that alone 115,000 people living in those conditions and lots of these people are working uh, you know we must dispel the myth that uh, uh, people on benefits don't work uh, what can we expect uh, things won't get better because basically we have a new government that has sold its soul to private equity they cannot do any of the things they claim uh, unless they get money from private finance. And that is an enlargement of one of the slides you've just seen. Using private medicine makes things worse. People die because of health privatisation. Why is this happening? Well, a very simple reason. The NHS has been abolished. I won't go into all of those things. You can come back to them later and ask me questions about them. But, uh, they have to use suppliers now, main, many of them are American. Uh, and um, if you look at that video, uh, you'll get the URL later. If you get that video, that tells you everything. But it's quite shocking. I doubt some of you know that the NHS has been abolished. Second reason is because of what they call, ironically, fiscal responsibility. Both Tory, Labour and the Deform Party led by a man whose name rhymes with sewage, I think, um, uh, of pursuing Frederick Engels' policy. This is what Engels said in 1845. If you deliberately introduce a policy that makes life worse for people, you are committing social murder. So we yesterday installed a government that is committed to social murder because they believe in neoliberal economics. Okay, go back to the, uh, the bullet points. Right. Uh, points one and 
four make me very pessimistic, but I think they're the reality. Two and three, particularly the use of technology, might feel optimistic for some people. However, the things that make me pessimistic are because we're now we have health and welfare systems that are controlled by private corporations who aren't interested in people. Uh, in fact, in parts of the world like Merrill, it's worse. And because organizations like Big Pharma uh, and American health corporations, health insurance corporations, I need to say, are not interested in you and me. They're interested in our data uh, and they're interested in uh, selling us health, not us getting it. What can you do? Uh, I'm suggesting that you read Private Eye. Every fortnight it's, it's got a good column about medicine and health. Uh, I suggest you mug up on modern monetary theory uh, because that's the alternative to the rubbish that our Rachel Reeves and our George Osborne's and all the others uh, propagate. And you do something about it uh, in order to dispel, because this was my main thesis, Margaret Thatcher was the devil incarnate. Um, you know, she told us that we're like a household and we can't exceed our spending. We can exceed our spending. They can find this magic money tree and they can max out the credit card when it's um, uh, a case of murdering lots of children in uh, Iraq or in uh, Gaza. Uh, and that's me. Whoosh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'll move the, um, move the microphone down for somebody who's a little bit shorter than you. Uh, next up, we have also somebody who, who will disappear beneath the water uh, on the Wirral. Um, is, uh, I'm assuming, I'm, I'm not... I think we're on the shoreline. Yeah, oh, there you go. He's on the shoreline, so he's... he's oh, you're not gonna be, you think you're going to be on the shoreline in 20 years' time? Okay, fair enough. Um, I don't think so, Francis. I think you and I will be meeting up in the pub for a long time to come. Uh, so, uh, Francis Fish, uh, with his talk, I will start your slides, he'll appear on there, uh, but let me start the slides first. Yeah. Mine's, mine's saying there is some hope, just, just, just by the way. So, hard to believe there being any hope. Okay, um, Acid Communism is an unwritten book by Mark Fisher, who is a British cultural theorist. Um, he only wrote the introduction to the book, which you can find online, it's well worth a read, uh, before he died, unfortunately. In his early writing, he talked about hauntology, which is the, essentially the idea that the future has been cancelled and the present is nothing but nostalgic remixes of an imagined and made-up past, which is kind of what we have now if you look at the culture. Capitalist decay is treated with denial, so we have this grasping at a, a faux version of the future to justify the pain that we experience in the present. Later, we developed the idea of capitalist realism, um, where we're disciplined to believe that there is no alternative, which is a neoliberal mantra, but we can make an alternative. He also wrote an essay called Exit the Vampire Castle, which is about bringing class back into politics and no more cancel culture snobbery. The Vampire Castle is a castle of the mind. Here's a quick quote from uh, Fisher in a sec. Uh, it, capitalist realism isn't the endorsement of neoliberalism. It's the idea that own, neoliberalism is the only thing we can have, and there's no point in fighting it. Acid communism is instead reclaiming the future, reclaiming the idea of what counterculture that's not part of the mainstream that we can embrace and extend to meet our needs. Neoliberal thinking has left us with an insurmountable doom and gloom where we basically have everything coming to an end, because capitalism is proving itself ever more unsuitable, and therefore means the end of everything. If all we have is capitalist collapse to look forward to, then that's it. We're done. Fisher believed that a better world is necessary and possible. The other point here is that the status quo is not the status quo. The apparent status quo is the exact opposite because society is falling apart, the world is falling apart, we have the ego side. Um, so to do nothing is to actually fail by default. So instead what we need is a convergence of countercultures. Fisher talks about the feminist movement, the, the counterculture movement of the hippies, and the anti-capitalist movements themselves, saying they need to reconverge and create a new kind of class consciousness which is much more open and caring. So what we need to be free is in fact post-capitalist desire, um, a desire to live in a world where, 
nobody, where everybody doesn't have to work, a world which is not dominated by the clock and by humans not having any value other than their labor. So the goal of anti-capitalism is that there are no more markets and we are not commodities. We actually have value as human beings. One of the other key ideas is the introduction of collecting thinking, collective thinking. No one is left behind and everyone's needs are met. Instead, you have a world where there isn't scarcity because everything, everyone has all they need. So instead, you have the cornucopia that is our birthright as human beings. We have the technology to build it right now. Neoliberalism's goal was to convince us that there is no alternative. We've had it hidden from us by lies about scarcity and war. Fisher talks about potentiality, where we can actually think about the spectre of a new world which could be free. The spectre is taken from Mark Marcuse, and he's playing here on the spectre of communism, haunting Europe, if you remember, in the opening of the Communist Manifesto. Um, but Marcuse was talking about the spectre of a better world haunting us, which is something we probably want. So we need to actually believe that the better world is possible and believe that things can be better. We need to throw away, we need to turn away from the negativity and despair that's been placed in our heads by neoliberalism. We need to recover our humanity and our connection with each other by working on how to work together. They are us and we are they. If all needs are met, then there is no need for conflict. Instead, much better grounds for love and understanding between people. The main thing neoliberalism has stolen from us is time. We've been given all these clever devices that steal our souls and keep us from thinking. They steal our lives from us, making it hard to do anything to affect change. If the only people, if only people cared as much about our beautiful world as they did about football, it would be a much better world. So where do we start? We need to actually start trying to think differently, trying to think collectively, and trying to think and work with each other. So we need to let this, let the new live and breathe. We need to let the world come, this world come into being. The third thing he talked about was the psychedelic movement, acid love. We were talking about the summer of 1967. We actually need more than the summer of love. Fisher said the 60s were the prelude to a much grander experiment that happened in the early 70s. Um, and that, that's actually what neoliberalism destroyed, such as what happened in Chile. Now we should, how should we start thinking about decades of love, centuries of love? How do we make a better world? And how do we consciously get to a world where we all have what we need instead of as I said there, stumbling into unconscious barbarism. Thank you very much. Actually, I, yeah, I, have, to, I have to declare I am an anti-capitalist. Um, that'll be five pounds. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, next up is uh, John. Daly, sorry, I was just trying to remember. I knew that I knew your surname. I was just trying to fish it out of my brain. Uh, John Daly, uh, if you'd like to take the stage, uh, then I'll start your presentation. I can't stand here and talk. It's just one of the things. Oops, sorry. Would you like to move this? Just there. Cool. Just to let everyone know, guys, uh, yeah, I'll be talking about housing in Liverpool till 2050 and beyond. So, we've just had a general election and loads of interesting things have been discussed. But one thing that came out was around housing. But there was one thing about housing that got discussed the most, and it was all around targets for national house building. 300,000 a year, what we've seen. And the last time we hit that was 1969. We're building about 150 to 200,000 now. And believe it or not, that is enough to ensure that we're growing with the population of the country when it comes up. Just like that, so we're literally in line. If we hit 300,000, we end up with a situation we are at with the homeless and the empty homes. It's like, we've just got too many homes, so why are we doing it? So it's more about a sustainability issue rather than a stock issue. To the point where the UK Green Builds Council said that 80% of homes we currently have are going to be here by 2050. So as a housing professional, I'll say to you, why are we focusing on 20% of the problem with new homes when we need to be focused on 80% sustainability of our stock? Now again, looking at that sustainability, carbon emissions is a big thing and housing accounts for 20% of all emissions. The Paris Agreement 2016 and activists like Greta Thunberg will tell us that we need to be keeping on around this. It's really important. And that's been reflected in national challenges for the Climate Change Act in 2008 
In 2019, that got updated by Chris Skidmore, the net zero minister at the time, and there are 10 papers on how we achieve this in housing. Some of them agree with each other. It's never easy. But again, you don't have to look so far outside of your front door because utilities went up about 9%, food has went up 20% inflation, rent 9% and mortgages up to 6% mortgages. It's not just about housing in general, it's about affordability and sustainability of living in them. But who's gonna afford this? If we wanna get net zero in private and the public sector, it's gonna be around 200 billion pounds on 2050. Who's gonna pay for it? It's mad. But what does that mean in terms of Liverpool? We've got around 230,000 homes and servicing 500,000 people. We need another 60,000 by 2045. But at the same time, we've got our own challenges. And the first one being around how we use our stock. So believe it or not, families are getting older because we've got better medicine, better care, etc. But at the same time, the biggest proportion of homes are in council tax band day. So how do we make it more sustainable going forward in terms of size? Also along this as well, we are the third most deprived ward in the country for health and wealth and a number of other things. So we have to ensure affordability and equality with life opportunities. So really, really important. But also on the back of that is all around energy as well. So 55% of our homes are under EPCC, which is the government's target for 2030 energy standards. So again, Fuel poverty is a massive, massive issue in Liverpool, and at the same time as well, it's an inequality with deprivation. So what do we do? The healthy homes agenda is a big thing. It costs, with damp and mould, the NHS £540 million a year nationally, which is absolutely crazy. At the same time as well, I don't have to speak anymore about the, the untimely death of Awar Ishak, because that was really difficult, that was hard in them issues. But what are we doing, boots on the ground? We're doing insulation projects, mostly with external wall insulation, internal wall insulation, as well as underfloor insulation by Cubot, by Robotics. And of course, using sheep's wool and other sustainable materials for loft insulation. We're also as well seeing increase in the use of hydrogen, electric in terms of ground source and air source heat pumps, as well as solar PV to help actually provide not just clean electric, but cheaper electric and generation as we go. But 20% of your bill is all down to the way that you use it. And things such as your switches, your hives, your dials, Google Nests, they happen to automate what is going on to the point that it takes away some of the user issues. So what does it mean for housing in Liverpool by 2050? Four things. T, technology will be prevalent. We're going to have smarter homes. We're going to see this a lot more as we go, as you've just seen. If you want to see more, come speak to me afterwards. The next one is around the E when it comes up. The... <laughs> We're going to have a VHS versus Betamax or a Blu-ray versus DVD for electric versus hydrogen. It's going to be really interesting. The exciting bit is the technology is not fully formed. So we're going to see how that changes as we go. The next one is around the C, which is the community culture around energy usage. So say before, 20% of usage is down to the way you use it. It's great that us as a circle know that. Well, how many people out there know that? That many. And what can we do around it? And H is about well, having your say in your communities. It's great people like me being on stage talking about this and chatting wham all the time about it. But at the same time, we have to come together and speak to our leaders and keep people accountable to achieve sustainable homes, sustainable neighbourhoods and sustainable lives towards 2050 and beyond. Brilliant, thank you very much. That was, all, that was all really good, thank you very much. Uh, if you want to take this opportunity to take some stair, uh, some chairs at the back there, uh, there are going to be some available. Um, so if we can have our speakers, if you, the speakers can go up to you, your front, while we load the guns at the back. That'd be great. Um, we'll take this out of the way. This for now. Uh, no, I will... Yeah, uh, one of you three, so you'll pass this backwards and forwards. Can you hear me? Well, it, it, guys, it, 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 with a mallet. There you go, thank you very much for that, uh, Francis. Uh, deep insight there into uh, whatever it was you were saying. Um, <laughs> So I'd first start off with, I'd like to thank you all for uh, taking part because it's really good that people come along and think we've got something to say 
but it always makes it really interesting for everybody that's here. Um, where am I going to start? I'll start with you because it's no, it was just the, the community, that kind of community heat element. I remember back. Um, I remember back in the day. This was in the Victorian area, era, uh, off Penny Lane, uh, where the Penny Lane Shopping Centre is now in Liverpool. There used to be uh, a Victorian uh, during the Victorian era. They used to collect all the rubbish and waste there. They would burn all the rubbish and waste there. There was no plastic, so it wasn't you know a big problem. They burn all the rubbish and waste. All the water would be heated centrally. Uh, and that water would then be pumped out to, uh, I think it was a local hospital, uh, the Blue Coat School used to be an old hospital and it used to be pumped out there. And so that, that idea of community generation of heat, uh, hot water, that kind of thing, I find that those kind of ideas are very, very interesting. I wanted to say that because I was going to forget it. Um, but other than that, um, I've made some notes. Uh, as I said, uh, Francis, I'm going to be Modern anti cavalist uh, That wasn't a joke. Um, does so? I, I've said my piece. <laughs> does anybody have any questions from the audience? Sorry, do you I want to say, can I come back to that? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, I appreciate that. Also, one of the things I didn't highlight on the slides is that is still a common thing. So, communal heat networks are something that is going to be utilised a lot more. We see this a lot more in uh, communal areas such as like flats etc but the big goal for us and i work i mean I work in the private sector now and i did work in the social housing sector is how do we start connecting the sectors together with this to ensure that we're using things quite in the circular economy we're trying to use it more and more as we go so the idea is around so i just want to make a general statement that is a big thing but if you want to speak to me afterwards around that we can have a chat brilliant thank you very much does anybody else have a question Do, do we combined heat and power plants? We got any in the pipeline? Combined heat and power plants. Generally Just generally, do we do we know if we have any in the pipeline? Have we got combined heat and power plants? In the pipeline. In the pipeline. In Scandinavia, they have them everywhere. In Scandinavia, they have them everywhere. Absolutely. Just no, absolutely. And again, it's a bit of an interesting one. This, because I say we see in the political spectrum that we're trying to use other forms of renewable energy, such as you know your nuclear and that. I'm not a big fan of it. Being totally honest with you, absolutely, I agree with you. And I agree there needs to be more shared resources around that. Scandinavia is obviously leading the way around this. We've seen this in other places like Iceland and a few others, and it's very, you know, a place that we, we, sh we should be in. It's not new. They've had it in Scandinavia. I understand, but again, sometimes it's, it's down to political agenda. So to give you an idea, when I was talking about hydrogen and lectured before, the Tandy versus B uh, Beta Max versus VHS. The government have two separate funds, but they're already preferring our air source heat pumps. So they've already set a government goal of 600,000 by 2020. So I agree that it needs to be expanded, but at the same time, hydrogen's got some really, really good uses. And again, there's other ways of doing it, but again, it requires infrastructure and investment. As I said before, who's going to pay for it? But again, there's only one way to pay for it. Combined, well, I did offer the microphone to you, you ignored me. Uh, <laughs> combined heat and power plants are usually built on small scale. Helps if you and do. they um, just do certain neighbourhoods. So they can be built a lot cheaper than other things. Is there none of it coming into line? in the UK. So it is coming to life but as you quite rightly said it's small scale at the minute so for instance for what we're doing and in terms of the social sector as well you see this where it's like micro generation so you get it on a specific site it might be a small community together doing this but remember although it's offering cheaper energy that's more renewable etc it effectively becomes its own energy company and being able to actually to do this it's how to administer so to give you an idea on this I understand that, but at the same time, who's administering it? If it gets left with the residents, and it's a real big infrastructure issue, I totally agree with it, but it's how do we be innovative in doing that? Okay, thank you very much. And there's another question over here. Or did you want to jump in on that? It's relevant to this one. Uh, actually, it's relevant to all of you. Um, I think communities have been so disenfranchised that they, don't, they can't come together anymore. Uh, I've just come back from Finland and I have seen how everything is about working with the community all the time. Now before Covid, uh, I'm very interested in the NHS as Kevin knows, 
and its future. And um, in fact, I was in 17 different organizations, locally and nationally, about health, particularly about mental health. All of them have been uh, disenfranchised. They've all disappeared. They've all got rid of. We were doing really useful, valuable work, and we've all gone. And the whole idea now is to disempower the local community groups. We've all got to become atomized so that we can't work together. We don't have the means to work together. Whereas what I saw in Helsinki was how everybody came together in a way that I have never, ever, ever seen before. And I have looked at similar institutions uh, across different countries as well as here. It is fantastic what they're doing in Helsinki and they're not doing anything like that here to help empower communities. People are just, they close as many things as possible, make sure things are uh, owned by corporate bodies so that you can't have evening meetings anymore, that things like the Workers' Education Association seems to have disappeared, that did such a lot of useful work in encouraging people into talking together in groups and solving problems, they're all gone. So it's really about how to construct together, how communities can come together and how the, the venues to be able to do it. Ideally not as noisy as this one, or pubs. You know, pubs are too noisy, you can't have any sense of discussion there. Yeah, I think Judith is right. Uh, and I think what needs to be emphasised is that we live in very dangerous times. I, mean, the, I guess the narrative about most things, um, like health, like housing, uh, like transport, is the danger of privatisation. Uh, the parties will have a view on it. The Tories want to do more, uh, Deform want to do more, Labour want to do more, Greens want to do less. You know, give it back to the people who, who paid for it and uh, who use it. Uh, but it's worse than that now because privatisation is not really an issue for the, the evil geniuses like Elon Musk behind this or in a very innocent way people like Steve Rodman. You know, our Metro Mayor is fully signed up for something called the Freeport. Uh, the Freeport is sort of contradiction in terms. There's a bit of port in Liverpool and Birkenhead, but most of the port is 43 kilometres, which extends all the way back to Salford. And basically, it's a gift by us to Peel Holdings, registered office, Isle of Man. Uh, and free ports will eventually have control over lots of things, uh, and they will privatise lots of things. They'll help to privatise our health, our schools, our transport, all the rest of it. But that's, that's not really the goal. The goal is a charter city, American style. Because the people who believe in all this, this brand of economics, uh, are not just sort of capitalists who are deluded. It's as Francis alluded to in some of his great quotes. These are people who believe that nothing should be public. Everything should be theirs and everything should be available only for profit. Uh, charter cities, that's what, that's what, I mean, we, we're at the cusp of civilization because we are destroying all the myths and narratives that they've very successfully built up for decades. You know, we believe we cause inflation so we can't ask for a pay rise. We believe we cause inflation so doctors and nurses have had to have their pay rise by, pay cut by 35% over the last 14 years. Well, Rude word beginning with B and ending in CKS, you know. Um, the reason we would have inflation is because of rentier copy capitalism. You know, people own land and they own property and they suck it. They suck it for rent and they suck the lives out of the people who live in it. So at dangerous, dangerous, dangerous times and you know, I'm afraid housing is a huge part of that, but it's just one thing along the way. Yeah, I was just saying to Kevin off mic as well, we've, we've had 50 years of Thatcherism, 50 years of that neoliberal 
individualistic view of the world. And it has broken this, it's made us completely atomized. And that, that's, I think that's what Fisher was talking about. You know, we, we need to rebuild that sense of community and be open to t speaking to each other. Uh, I mean, but I, we've all got this individualistic thing in our heads. It's been put there, but they've been, it's been coming through the TV. It's been coming, and like consciously saying, no, I'm not going to be like that. No, I'm not going to be selfish. Um, no, I am going to offer somebody else some sweeties. Um, that kind of thing. I mean, and I, but, you know, I, I, I'm saying that in a silly way, but you, you know what I mean? Consciously thinking, how can I help other people? How can I work with other people? And things like these, we were saying, you know, we, we lack these community um, power generation. We lack community heat generation. Um, I live in an old Victorian house. I'm lucky, I'm, I can afford to pay the bills, but, my, but the bills are astronomical. And I used to be able to save and I can't anymore. <laughs> because my, what the money that would have been going in my savings is going to the power company. So, and I'm lucky. The people who are on, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of average, the very low incomes, I have no idea how they're managing at the moment. And I don't want to live in that world. I just don't. And, and it's optional. That's what, not, that's what so frustrating. We're told, this is what the, the, my talk is about, we're told we have to put up with this. We don't. We can live in a much more pleasant world where there isn't an ecocide coming, where there, isn't, there aren't mass extinctions, where we have sustainable and renewable technology that keeps us alive and, 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 and helps us bring up our kids, and where we don't have to work 40 hours a week for somebody we, we despise. We can live in that world. Uh, and, but because we've been so individualized, we don't, we, we're not used to looking and helping, working with each other. And they can pick us off one by one, but they can't pick us off when there's thousands of us. Um, anyway, I, I think I'll stop ranting now. <laughs> uh, good points, guys. I think for me, um, I've made a career out of residence engagements, trying to get people involved. I think for me, sometimes it's difficult. I mean, some really good points for you too, that, you know, Media's a big influence, you know, it's just individualization. That was a really good point, that, by the way. And again, you know, we're seeing this Americanization and privatization. I think they're really good points, but it requires people to turn the telly off, or it requires people to be able to show there is another way. So for me, my whole motto is being there to be different. You know, I was told for years and years on end that social housing was going to get worse. Even in the private sector, it was just, it was always going to get worse. You know, we've seen some terrible things around things like Grenfell, we've seen Abbey Abishak happen, etc. But at the same time, then it's where can you change them challenges and then absolute challenges into an opportunity to make things better. And for me, I don't think it would have got anywhere if I just said that's the status quo. To quote your point before, you know, I believe there is a better way, there's a better way of doing things. And likewise, some of the things now, especially with the new government, when are we campaigning for this? Do we come together? Do we have people who are leaders and passionate? Because again, even here, picking up the mic and asking these questions, that's a form of community leadership. It inspires others to think about that. You're making me think. And why can't we have them conversations and try and make that movement bigger? My biggest thing at the end of my presentation was Dr. H and have an hour say, we need to keep leaders accountable for what we're trying to achieve. And for me, that only happens with people. And the challenges are there, but how can we change them? Challenges of individualization that negation of what's going on into an opportunity because it can only last so long I'm sure if you've read Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions I'm sure you're the type of guy who read that I love it it can only go so far before a piece of evidence or a piece of research or an individual thought makes things go there's a different way in. and we have to do that together brilliant thank you very much uh, any other questions uh, Gary, Gary's coming around. Hold on, Gary's got a question. Sorry, did you say you got a question? Uh, uh, okay, Gary, you can wait. We'll get Kath first. Take a seat there, Gary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to run around. Sorry about that, Gary. <laughs> Sit there looking grumpy. There you go. It's a pretty simple question, really. Because I think we've, you've um, referred to football and TV being a distraction to, um, you know, constructive activities. What other ways, what, what other barriers are there um, to prevent people from moving on from, from that, you get me? The, the constructive thought and debate, what other things are preventing um, us from doing that? 
I don't want a list of, I mean, because football is crap and telly is crap, but I don't want a list of things, but what, what is, is preventing people from gathering and so forth? I think Judith made the point earlier, actually, the public spaces we had in the 70s, um, the pubs, the, the community centres, um, they've gone. Um, so, the place where you would go to have a meeting in the evening. And the other thing as well is, I think there's a whole, there's rules about you can't be, quote, political if, if you want to have a meeting in a community centre. So even if you're talking about something that's really important for that community, if somebody points a finger and says you're being political, you're not allowed to have a meeting in a community centre. It's, it's essentially the other thing neoliberalism has done is with the privatisation of everything, it, the spaces we used to have, even the parks, are, are gone, or very difficult to use without getting pressure from the police or whoever. And youth clubs. <laughs> Um, that's one of my big beefs, that all the spaces that people used to meet and be not necessarily politicised, but aware of themselves in relation to the world. They've all got youth clubs and uh, another beef, the school curriculum has been destroyed, so kids no longer have civics, they no longer have politics, they no longer have general studies. But back to football, the question must be asked, why is it that you can go to Celtic and the whole ground will be waving Palestinian flags and not at many other football games? Why is it that you can go to Liverpool 1 and have a wonderful shopping experience but you try giving out a leaflet or selling a newspaper and a man in a red jacket will uh, tell you that the Duke of Westminster doesn't allow that? Uh, you try driving a car into the middle of Chester uh, and as soon as you get near the Grosvenor Hotel a man in a top hat and a tailcoat go if you don't believe me comes out of a little wooden box and says hello madam, hello sir are you going to the Grosvenor Hotel? the Duke of Westminster owns that sorry you'll have to park somewhere else now, you know, our land has been stolen from us the Duke of Westminster's family robbed, were given it as a gift by some king some time ago, I suppose. Um, uh, and their profits and their rents are what cause our problems. And along the way, they close our youth clubs and they close down the school curriculum because that stops people thinking, but it also costs money. Some really interesting points there, but I think for me, to be the other side of the coin, to be the disruptor, as always, um, I don't think, I mean, there's some really heavy emphasis on physical spaces. I totally agree, by the way, I would not disagree with that. But I think the challenge and the opportunity becomes that it's a differentiation of space now. So it's went from a physical space to a virtual space. Now, for me, being a very extroverted individual, I love my public spaces and people and physical interaction. It's still challenging for me, because for me, I prefer that face-to-face. -face. You're asking me this question now. But at the same time, is how do we adopt that virtual space? If you want a great documentary on that, it's The Social Dilemma, if you've ever seen it on Netflix. And saying it whilst again, there's a lot more connection, there's a hell of a lot more loneliness, and also there's a hell of a lot more mental health issues because of these virtual space adoptions. So come back to your point, you know, how do then we connect people in that? And how do we lead our ways? So that is a barrier, but again, it's up to us as a collective, not just me or anyone here or any one of you. How do we come together to be able to create an opportunity out of that challenge within the space? Hi. Hello. Um, I'm Gary. Is it John? Oh, Gary. Was it John? Yeah, it's me, yeah. I, I missed your um, presentation, so I just want to I've got a specific question. So, <clears throat> it strikes me as well, you're talking about individualism, that air source heat pumps seem to be like an individualised system that they're pushing out because everybody has to have their own and they're going to need service contracts to maintain them and all the rest of that and it just keeps everything all the money flowing but ground source heat pumps seem to be something that are best implemented at scale and it just seems that that is it just lends itself so well to a community solution so the question is given what you're doing how do i register interest or find out what you're doing in that space email me okay 
and, and the banter. No, okay. Right. No, but it's a really, really good point. So ground source heat pumps, yeah, they tend to be more effective. Um, they, the deeper you go, don't they? Yeah, so I mean, to kind of give a bit of a really quick whistle stop tour, air source requires, an, like again, it's like a reverse fridge. Brings an air from the outside, conditions it, and then makes it warmer or colder. However, the issue then with this, if you've got different temperatures of air, it can make it warm or cold, it can be a bit challenging. Whereas the ground source, I think it's after a couple of meters, it stays relatively the same. So even if like it froze over, it's the same. But there's a few things on the back of that. So as you know, the cost of that is massive. And as well, it's a more servicing, a more a bigger area, like a communal area. So you see it more in flats or at scale, as you quietly said. You wouldn't see that currently in individual homes as much. But again, not to be rude, but the answer is, email me or come and have a copy and we'll discuss more. Please. Any other, other you might need to <laughs> come closer, sorry. Uh, um, I suppose my question or um, idea comes from all three of you in the sense that uh, we mentioned children not being educated about policy and about politics and I've got a real problem with that working in early years but being interested in obviously older children and you but I think the generations our generation and the decades above have been spoiled post-war have been spoiled um, does the hope come in the younger generations now because they seem really interested in politics are they going to bring the change that we need granddad speaks um, <laughs> uh, well my my daughter's a good marxist i hope still if she hasn't been perverted by the german way of life and uh, I'm hoping she's bringing her uh, granddaughter up as a, a good thinking uh, person. Um, I don't despair. I, I mean, at times I do uh, because, you know, you, the screen. Uh, but I, I, can, can I just say, as we mentioned, though, there's opportunities in that. And, you know, you yeah. see some kids. It's frightening because the damage it is doing to kids' mental health, but, you, you know, the temptation with social media and what's available to us, if kids are interested, it is there, and you, you go down a rabbit hole, and, and you can find find the answers that you need, and I don't know if there's possibly, we're not realising this because we're scared of technology, just how how determined kids are to find answers that, you know, the youth are. Sorry. No, I, I, I think you're right, I think it requires some kind of momentum and some kind of intermediary. I mean, the problem is that TikTok in the last election, for example, and Instagram were dominated by fascists, you have to say, because a lot of activists uh, on the left in alternative organizations, I mean, I'm in the end of my eighth decade, you know, um, uh, and so I, I'm happy with Facebook and WhatsApp and email, but oh, not a bloody app on my bloody phone, you know. I, I prefer to talk to people. Um, so, but I think they need intermediaries, and very deliberately the school curriculum has been perverted. You know, Michael Gove is the main culprit in this, as in so many things. Uh, they did, you know, if they destroy your mind, they won't, haven't they? And, and that's the aim. So, I don't, I was going to say at the beginning, I don't despair because the young people we, we do know give me a lot of hope. Uh, my 12 year old granddaughter gives me hope, you know, but she, she lives in an, in an environment in uh, Munich in Germany that's, uh, that's very progressive. She goes to a progressive school. Uh, her, her dad, who's a blinking Microsoft engineer, so probably terrifies me, but you know, her, her dad is, um, is switched on to technology and, and her mum is switched on to other things. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure it should be okay, but it, it's it's breaking through those barriers. I suppose I'm saying go away from here and inhabit TikTok or something. You know, I, I don't know. We'll have to do, put this on the next agenda. Do this for our next. We need our own. We need there needs to be a community that's yeah. away from all those that are dominated. Yeah. And um, we take control of ourselves. Yeah. I, I I take a little bit of issue that I don't think we were spoiled. I think we live in a world. We lived in a world where actually, for all its faults, things were a lot more decent. 
and the people. Like, starving children in the 70s would have been a bloody scandal. And now it's okay. And homeless people, it would have been, I mean, there were some, but you weren't stepping over them everywhere you go. It would have been, and because we've been hypnotized by um, the, the sort of neoliberal consensus, we, we don't realize there was a better world which still needed a lot of work and it was destroyed and taken from us and we've been left with like the the dust um, of that of that destruction and but you can point to times even in this country when things were a lot better than they are now i remember um in my early 20s you know living in my own flat on benefits and actually you could live it wasn't great but you could live but now it's what's it's something like 80 quid a week how are you supposed to live on that it, it, it's an insult and, and that, that's what the frustrating thing is we weren't spoiled we had something really quite precious and it's been stolen from us and, that, and our kids have had it stolen from them and they don't even know the difference because nobody talks about it that, that, that's, that's, my, that's my opinion anyway Cheers uh, again I just feel like all I'm doing is disrupting <laughs> some really interesting points I mean, to use um, Francis, your, your expression there, well, it's more about ashes. Like, I do believe that a phoenix can ra rise from that. Um, for me, anecdotal evidence, personally, is that we need to be in a culture, especially with younger people, around activist leaders. So to give you an idea on this one, um, I work in social, I work in private, I do a lot of advocacy. And one thing that I really enjoy the most is being asked by universities and colleges and schools to go and talk there. I get worse questions from the kids than I do from the board. They're switched on. They're mega, mega switched on. And some of the questions, I'm like, well, I actually have to go away and research that. And you're like, you give me some. I'm not saying the kids don't understand what's going on. It's about how do you give them that safe space to be able to do it. But being totally honest, in terms of that community element, is that we have to provide the safe space. I don't personally believe that we have to put it on a curriculum. But it's down to people around who could literally bring people in and show that it all the way. So it's kind of similar. It's a bit more informed, but again, it's having that community of people to come and talk. So for me, as I say, after doing a couple of talks in different places, you know, unis and colleges and schools, like, would you come and do a talk? Or the other way around, me, as a person, I used to go to school, like, can I go and have a chat or whatever? And you put it in a language that kids would understand. That's okay when your message isn't contentious or seen as contentious, but that's you can't get in schools or, or anything. And that is the point. So, again, is how then do you work together as a community to be able to provide that? And likewise, for me, I haven't got a political agenda as such. I'm very policy driven. I have to work with whatever government. So, for me, I'm never going to say, oh, if we do this, it's going to be terrible because a blue person done this and a red person done that. Yeah, you've got to be very factual because ultimately, as well, you've got to allow for that freedom of thought. But Again, I agree with the panel, you know, it's a very challenging time and it's an area that's been quite dangerous, but again, is how do we then pick that up and work together to create a more optimist environment to be able to do that. Cheers. Do we have any further questions? Anybody want to make any particular statements? No? Okay. Uh, no, that was, that's, that's really good. I would say they're, they're going to oh, take over here. the only reason I know about this. Another thing that's very difficult is getting to know what is going on. I, there is something uh, on the Wirral, which may happen elsewhere as well, um, called Your Voice, which is about what's happening in health. I joined that, and all the things I want to talk about in those meetings, I can't. They said, we aren't commissioned. We aren't commissioned to talk about that. And so and my response to them is, well, what are you commissioned to talk about? And, and I'll deal with that. And the answer is none. There is no response to that. So it's really important that the three of you leave your contact details. And this Ignite thing, I've never heard of it until uh, Kevin told me he was speaking this afternoon. And um, so it's very difficult to know what is going on. I'm very anxious to come and contribute and 
you know, share what experience I have and what I have to say about things. Um, and, uh, and there's no opportunity for it, partly because of lack of space and because I don't really know what's going on. Like this organisation. Okay, thank you very much. If you can put together a presentation of 20 slides, uh, the next Ignite Liverpool will be taking place sometime later this year, and we'll get you up at, on the stage at Leaf Cafe on Bolt Street. Um, we ha In the previous, last year, we, haven't, we didn't do it this year, but last year we did uh, We're All Make Fest, and we had lots of people coming together. Again, it was a much smaller, very, sm very smelly room. Um, <laughs> sorry. It was, it was it was just quite close let's just say that it was a hot day um and uh, so the, the we do we do this out of the goodness of our own heart um and so we do have them taking place in different places at times when we've got the energy to do it but yeah get the contact details off kevin and um we'll get you signed up to give a presentation that's a nod that's a yes um we've got i've succeeded in recruiting a new speaker um, and if you know, if you three, are, if you want to come back at any point in time and do the talk again, a similar talk, same talk, whatever, so we flip it on its head, um, talk about how much, uh, how wonderful you think Thatcher is, Francis. Um, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, but I think that having these kinds of uh, having this kind of a space, it's an opportunity. It is creating that kind of community for people to ask questions. Um, and for people to discuss issues and go away, hopefully, you know, take some new ideas away or take some titles of some new books away or some new things to research, especially from yours, Francis. Um, like I said, the, the introduction is, is done and it's a good read, it's a really good read. Yeah, uh, we'll do that. Uh, Mark Fisher, Mark Fisher, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to, can I have a round of applause for our speakers? Thank you. Uh, a, round of, a round of applause. For Dan the Man, Dan the Man. Uh, and a round of applause for yourselves for uh, taking part. Um, and a round of applause for Neil because his tap dancing has been fantastic. <laughs> I don't remember tap dancing. Um, right now, you can all rush away if you wish. However, I do believe.